Now so hopefully, the disclaimer has said at the start of this video, if I remember to do it hours after making the video, is that, you know, I don't pretend to be an expert on these uh, things I've done. The tour guide part of it is that I am a tour guide on tour buses in London, you know, so to comment that I, I suggest a lot of people to this drivel, i.e. my sacrifice of the 51st Highland video uh, is both untrue but also the slightly random because why would I mention the 51st Highland on a tour around London? That's not to be spying for anything but I wouldn't have minded if the comment had stopped at pulling me up on my facts and then just you know saying it's part of the world of fake news I do these videos both to pass my time to get me through the lockdown we had last year and also just to sort of just talk history I base it on the facts that I've read uh, the books I've read the things I've seen my own opinions so you know what you're gonna hear now is just my interpretation I don't declare it as fact so, for whatever reason, both for, uh, as part of the tour guide and job and being stuck in lockdown last year, I suddenly became much more interested in Charles II than I have done before. I've always been aware of him since I was little when I read, uh, saw illustrations of the Great Fire and the king on his horse uh, taking charge of the firefighting efforts. Uh, the Great Fire before we press on, was the second of a triple whammy, you might say, that affected uh, England and the King, both directly and indirectly, and all the rest of it, between 1665 and 1667. In 1665 was the Great Plague, which mostly affected London, of course, and killed tens of thousands of people, and people were locked in their house, of course, for 40 days, so they had even the slightest symptom. 66 was a course of fire, and 67 was when the Dutch sailed up the Medway, messed about with the ships and stole the King's pride flag, uh, pride of, uh, well his flagship, the pride of uh, the Navy, uh, the Charles, or the Royal Charles, which was formerly the Naseby and the Cromwell, and had indeed been sent to uh, bring Charles back from his exile to restore the throne. This year is effectively a uh, long forgotten anniversary, two anniversaries of Offence and nowadays, you know, of course, are so far behind us in our history that much as we are now thinking of perhaps of the First World War and certainly things like the Napoleonic, the Crimea War and anything that happened in between uh, it's not something that's affected us personally yet. Offence that have changed our history and possibly the history of the world in their way. You've got 1661, I'm, this is where my mask fails me, 360th anniversary of the restoration of the throne after the years of the Republic or Commonwealth and then of course prior to that the 370th anniversary of the Battle of Worcester in 1651. By 1651 Cromwell and the Commonwealth had been ruled in England for almost two years, a little around two years. The offence prior are far too complicated and long and um, muddled to really go into detail, but essentially, you know, 1642, the first civil war starts. Uh, Charles I is defeated, captured. There's another two civil wars, that, uh, sorry, another civil war that brews up, and Charles escapes and tries to get the Scots to get involved and all the rest of it. And then in January 1649, Charles Stuart becomes the first and only monarch in British and English history to be executed, and certainly executed on the orders of Parliament. You'd think that would be the end of it, but his son, who is now of course grown, uh, is getting into his 20s now, um, in his late 20s, yeah, you know, so my mind just went back to Charles I. Um, he of course wants uh, to get even, but also just the sort, the Republic is not, uh, at this time, still really concrete and secure. It's a little bit fragile on his roots. And technically, even though he restores the throne and becomes Charles II ten years later, Charles, Prince of Wales, um, the moment his father's head left his body, uh, became Charles II. 
So you know, on one hand, he reigned for he was technically king for you know he's technically king for what say eleven years um, from sixteen sixty before sixteen sixty. Uh, 1661 being the coronation, I guess, hit the, the concrete underlining. He marshals forces, and him and Cromwell clash on the streets of Worcester. Probably one of the last full scale engagements on English soil, uh, and certainly one of the most decisive. Doug Cromwell for, uh, was, I guess, a military genius, a tactical genius, and he certainly outsmarted Charles here by. Charles fought tenaciously and some perhaps would say desperately to try and stop Cromwell, racing through the streets on his horse, urging his troops on, and the troops fought bravely. It of course didn't end well for Charles, or England some might say. Charles ended up uh, doing his infamous flight, including hiding in the Wall Oak, which at one point was I think the most, uh, the most popular name for a pub in England until recently. Uh, we even had a ship or two named after her, after it. And Charles eventually reached uh, Dorset, Hampshire Way, and uh, got out of the country and spent, you know, ten years, in, well, nine years in exile. Worcester is not remembered in, uh, in this country as such. And as I was saying to somebody recently, in Charles Spencer's book, To Catch a King, in the prologue, it says that, I believe it was John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, maybe Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, but it's only two that the, the found, uh, Jefferson was there and one, uh, and one of the other the founding fathers. And this was in the 1790s, so America now has been in existence for what, almost 20 years. Um, and they are somebody, I don't know, I mean they came out to Worcester itself and said, um, where can we find the battlefield? And they were, and you know, this is what, a century, on, a century or so on for it, and they were like, what battlefield? And they said, well, the Battle of Worcester. And effectively said that were it not for Worcester, uh, the United States might not have happened. I mean, if, if somebody may correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm sure I've read in a few books now, like Charles Spencer or Tony Frazier, that the Civil War and certainly the creation um, of the Republic uh, and what Cromwell did sort of uh, gave bones to what became the American Constitution a century later, or at least inspired them. And the Battle of Worcester, therefore, was seen, I believe, probably by Jefferson as like securing the freedom and I mean liberty of the English people from the yoke of ty tyranny under the monarchy. And th uh, they were shocked that Worcester was not preserved as a battlefield. And the Americans, I think, are awfully good at that, that kind of thing. Whatever you say about the reasons why and how it looked, I think. You know, they've got what Gettysburg, but Gettysburg is preserved, it's protected. I think some of, of, of course, the uh, Revolutionary War battlefields are, or at least places like Bunker Hill, Yorktown, Saratoga, uh, the Civil War, obviously. And they've got, I'm not right, they're a big country, and states like, have got a, you know, a state government's probably got more money than Britain has, but they've got. Aircraft, a, f many, a few aircraft carriers from World War Two preserved. They were trying to preserve the JFK, I think, and some of the other more modern carriers. They've got submarines preserved. Uh, if we get, I mean, they've got a lot of preserved from the war. Destroyers, cruisers, battleships. I mean, all the big gun Ira class battleships, I think, are still preserved. So again, make correct me. Whereas Britain, Naseby, Marston Moor. Bosworth, even Hastings or Battle, because technically where the battle took place is now called Battle outside of Hastings. Um, I said Edgehill, 
Worcester. I think even Clodden in Scotland. Uh, none of it is at least pointed out. There's no, I don't think, from what I understand, in Charles Spence, but nothing seems to be signposted. You know, and these battles in the Civil War, like Marston Moor, Edgehill, even places like Turn and Green, which is now South West or West London, nothing's there to tell you that these things happened to you. Even Bosworth, you know, I mean, where did we find Richard III's bones under a bleeding car park? <laughs> um, Although I guess by that, of course, the battle, but you know, the body being dragged, dragged out and treated rather shit. Really. We've got HMS Belfast, the Cavalier in uh, Chatham. I think we've got, uh, we've got a uh, diesel sub there, the Mary Rose. Although it's not really a ship, is it? It's, in, uh, it's a part of the ship, the Fitzroy, of course. But we don't have that much. Some would say it's money as far as ships go, but. We haven't got aircraft carrier preserved. You know, it would have been nice say to have kept the Invincible. But there was no money, she was, she was scrapped. The same was true of the Art Royal. Never heard anything planned for the Illustrious. She just went straight off to the Breakers. Um, we obviously can't really keep our nuke subs as such. I mean, the Conqueror is preserved in Plymouth, but in my opinion, the wrong sub to keep. Uh, as a museum ship, why not the uh, the Conqueror? You know, so far the only nuclear-powered submarine to sink a ship in battle during the Falklands, or maybe it's because of that connection. You know, the Belgrano sinking is still rather shocking, even though even the Belgrano captain said she was sailing away. That's why sailing too. Um, so anyway, I went off a little bit. We're still. Lent legitimacy to the Cromwell's government. It happened, apparently, a lot of things happened on Cromwell's birthday. Balf Worcester, uh, he died on his birthday, I think, and something else that it happened. Um, but presumably, he went back to London or wherever, and I was like, okay, he got away, but we defeated him soundly. And uh, the Republic wasn't strong, really, economically, even militarily. Um, it did many things that history still looks back on, of course, quite rightly, like Ireland and Jamaica, uh, the Caribbean and stuff. And of course, we, you know, what, once the monarchy was restored, things carried on in a certain vein. But oh, fast forward to 1658, Cromwell dies, and such was the nature of the makeup of his government. Um, it, was, it was falling apart. It probably started falling apart the moment he drew his last breath. He said that yeah, effectively, you know, my son Richard's going to take over, and somebody wants him not. Richard was probably the least prepared, most ill equipped, ill suited, incompetent head of state this country has ever had and indeed right if you think about it as also noted by somebody else he also became one of the longest living ex heads of state because obviously he you know he, he left power and he buggered off and i guess the same could be said of the duke of windsor as he became but he's usually head of state is monarch until they die always is Again, it's a rather convoluted process to how we get to it, but Charles returns, agrees to return under certain caveats by Parliament and the rest, and he lands at Dover and proceeds up to London and meets the army at Blackheath. Uh, a little bit of nerves, I'd imagine, because the army is mostly still, of course, made up of roundheads. And then a year later in 1661, he's crowned. All is forgiven. It was maybe one of the largest coronation uh, we've ever had in this country. Uh, certainly one of the most expensive. And uh, indeed, Charles II probably started the country's national debt. Charles II did a lot to give us the monarchy we have now. now 
monarchy of 1661 is vastly different now to the one of 2021. Kings uh, and indeed the Queen uh, had power, proper, proper power. Um, if, say, the Queen had had the power Charles II and monarchs up to about Victoria and Edward VII had, you know, this whole Brexit business, you know, when the Queen, they said the Queen should have gone forward, then the Queen could have done. You know, she could have summoned Boris and said, why, why we're going to do it my way. Uh, we'll do X, Y and Z. Um, she would be getting a lot more money from the public, because a lot, most of the money went, should, of course, have to pay the military now much more directly. Um, there's a lot of things to go into that I can't cover, but... But of course Charles was not a perfect man <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. This is a man who had 11 or so illegitimate children and the mothers mostly uh, mostly all became duchesses and some had more power than the, at some point it seemed the king himself had. And you know, you got the likes of Nell Gwynn, the Duchess of Portsmouth and Barbara Phileas and was it Laura Palmer and all the rest of them. And he never produced a legitimate heir to the throne. And that changed history. Because we've got James II, his brother, who even the king had said, uh, Charles had said, was ill suited. You know, there was it that line, you know, James said to him, Why is it you have a bodyguard and I don't, kind of thing? Or at least, why do you have more? Well, who would want to kill me to have you as king? Um, James was Catholic, Parliament didn't like this. James disposed, effectively, chased him to exile, would go over to Holland. <laughs> and bringing William the Third and, you know, James's daughter Mary. And then Anne comes along and then unfortunately um Anne dies around a direct heir and we end up going over to Germany. Um It's intriguing to think what life could have been like now or history had been had. Charles produced at least uh, a, leg a legitimate heir to the throne and say that, you know, he dies in 1685 and the boy ascends to the throne and rules over England for 30 years. By that point, he's got heirs himself. They rule England and they could feasibly have lasted into the 19th century. Or at least um, the late 18th, or what if, you know, it didn't go to, um, there wasn't any Queen Victoria to take over, or the Duke of Windsor never abdicated the throne and had children, or Prince George didn't die in the war, because I think he would have been king if, it would, he could possibly have ended up becoming king after his brother. If something could happen to Elizabeth anyway, but anyway, for all that stuff. Um, so Worcester and the Restoration were quite important to our history and possibly world history. Because of course the uh, United States was ultimately born out of um, England. And of course Charles sent people to the colonies to get some of the regicides. Uh, so there we go. As I said, I don't pretend to be an expert. I'm sorry if I've bored some of you if you've made it this far, but thank you for watching. Uh, take care.